I went to an F1 team to see how Formula 1 brakes work and the incredible engineering behind them. But first, let me tell you why they're so important. In Formula 1, drivers slam on the brakes at over 200 miles per hour, and in just four seconds, they come to a near stop. That's a deceleration so extreme it hits nearly 6G, enough force to make it impossible for most normal people to keep their head up. They're not just powerful. They can reach temperatures over 1,000 degrees Celsius, about as hot as molten lava. Plus, the driver has to push down on the brake pedal with 180 kilograms of force. Imagine trying to lift a full-size refrigerator with one leg. That's about how much force an F1 driver applies to the brake pedal. So how do the brakes cope with such intense forces? And how does the entire braking system work? Well, to find out, I went behind the scenes with the Alpine F1 team to uncover the cutting edge tech behind modern Formula 1 braking systems. So why do brakes matter so much in Formula 1? Why do teams pour millions into perfecting them? Well, it's all about lap time. Let's take two cars, both flying down a straight at 200 miles per hour. The first car approaches a corner and hits the brakes 100 meters before the turn, slowing to 35 miles per hour at the apex. Now, let's take a look at the second car. It's also going 200 miles per hour, but this one brakes later, at just 90 meters before the same corner. It still slows down to 35 miles per hour at the apex, but by braking 10 meters later, it's now 0.078 of a second faster. That's almost a tenth of a second. And that might seem small, but in Formula One, teams spend millions trying to shave off just one tenth of a second per lap. All right, so let's take a look at the incredible engineering behind the F1 braking system. This is Alex Stevens, the sub-assembly team leader at Alpine F1, and he's walking me through all of these parts. Before we jump in, it's important to know that everything we're looking at comes from a modern Formula One car, with most of it coming from the Alpine RS20B, their 2020 car that carried over into 2021. So this is predominantly uh, RS20B, so 2020 car that carried over to 2021. Some One or two of the parts are a little bit older, but most of what you see is 2020 model, yeah. So let's start right at the beginning with the brake pedal. The driver hits that with about three times their own weight. So it's about 180 kilos, 160, 180 kilos that this thing sees, which is pretty mad considering how much it weighs. This pedal is designed and manufactured in-house at Alpine. It's made from a single piece of carbon fiber to keep it lightweight, but incredibly strong. And the first thing that stands out to me is just how big that brake pedal is. Is this for Ocon? Got big feet, right? Yeah, it is. is yeah, it? it is. It is. <laughs> So each of the pedals are made to the driver's feet. If you've got a right. driver with larger feet, we have a larger pedal. Got you. And yeah, Estevan has got big feet, so he has a big pedal, <laughs> simple as that. But they, they do actually scan them and then we actually make and cut the pad to suit the driver. It's paired with a simple aluminium clevis for the pivot position that bolts onto the bottom of the tub and a titanium clevis at the back to connect it to the master cylinder. And that's all. Now, the brake pedal may look simple, but it's only one part of a much more complex system. Once the driver presses the pedal, that force is transferred into the master cylinder, where it's converted into the hydraulic pressure that powers the brakes. This pedal then connects to the brake master cylinder here. We have, a, we have an eyelet unit that, again, depending on the driver and how tall or short they are, that eyelet changes because the tub doesn't change driver to driver. We often swap the chassis. The master cylinder doesn't change driver to driver, but the eyelet does. In Formula One, you're not adjusting the driver's seating position like in a road car. Instead, the steering wheel and pedals are moved to suit the driver, which then allows the driver's weight to be kept centrally located. And the pedal itself is tuned to the driver's preference, depending on how heavy they want it to feel. It's a big, heavy spring to push. Estevan likes yeah. a really heavy spring. He doesn't like a light feeling one. Okay. They want it. Estevan particularly likes really hard and instant without any travel. That spring sits here, resisting the movement of the shaft going into the master cylinder. It acts as a kind of tuner, but the real force, the feeling of a heavy pedal, comes from the hydraulic pressure. And this feeling on the brake pedal is critical for drivers because it allows them to be more confident when they're braking late. And also they can control the brake pressure better, meaning they'll lock up less. They say that the heavier that is, the more feedback and feel they get. So that's yeah. why they like that spring. 
So how does the master cylinder actually work? Well, in a modern Formula One car, things are a bit more sophisticated than the older systems, which used to have separate cylinders for the front and rear systems. The bias used to be controlled by a mechanical pivot point that shifted, giving more leverage to either the front or rear brake system. This would change the braking balance, more pressure on the front or more on the rear, depending on what the driver wanted. However, modern Formula 1 cars use a tandem brake master cylinder, which handles both the front and rear circuits in one go. So this is divided into two halves. You have the front circuit and the rear circuit. Okay. It's still only one shaft, one piston, but as you, as you hit the pedal and the shaft moves and it displaces the oil, yeah. it actuates both circuits in one go. And because the system needs to adapt the pressure sent to the rear brakes, it's not just mechanical. It's got a load of sensors too. So we've got a little non-contact sensor there that can detect where the internal piston is. Right. And it minuses it from the overall movement of the master cylinder, which is on this linear potentiometer here. Okay. And we can then calculate front circuit displacement versus rear circuit. And that information allows the brake by wire system to change how much pressure it sends to the rear. But before we get into that, I'd like your feedback on something. Most of you will know Willem Toit, the former head of aerodynamics at Ferrari, BMW and Sauber. Well, we've been discussing how we can teach more people about the fascinating intricacies of aerodynamics. Whether it's to bolster your CV, advance your engineering career, or simply dive deeper into the most critical subject in Formula One. Right now, we're doing some research and we'd like to understand if this would be interesting to you. So if you're at all interested, please take one minute to join the waitlist to hear more. Link in the description below. Once the piston in the master cylinder moves, the brake fluid travels towards the calipers. But to get there, it has to pass through a combination of hardline pipes and braided steel hoses. Now, you might ask, why use both of these types of pipes? The idea is if you can try and keep it in a hard line, it's A, neater for packaging, but B, more stiffness in the system. Even though braided steel hose is really, really good, super strong, you can still get a bit of flexibility in the system. It's not as good as a, a pipe. Yeah. There's, there's no room for a pipe to grow. So wherever possible, the team uses hardline pipes because they're stronger and won't expand under the immense brake pressure. However, the calipers are attached to the wheel hubs, which means they move up and down in relation to the car's chassis. And that's where the braided steel hoses come in. It allows for suspension movement without breaking the line. The only downside is that the slight flex in the hose reduces brake pedal feel just a little bit, making it a little less precise for the driver. So now the fluid has made its way to the caliper, which is a beautiful piece of engineering. So on the caliper, that's an aluminium alloy. Um, we can't go into the exact details and the specification of it, but it's a, it's, it's a trick lightweight alloy. These things are masterpieces, machined from a single block to be ultra strong yet lightweight. And to withstand the brutal heat during braking, they're nickel plated for added protection. Why? Well, because like the rest of the system, these calipers can't afford to flex or lose strength under pressure. They have to stay rigid, delivering consistent brake power for the driver. So you might think that these calipers are binned after every race, but that's surprisingly not the case. Calipers, master cylinder and pedal, we tend to do on a 2,500 kilometer service interval. So they'll have an overall life of about 10,000 kilometers but every 2,500 we'll ask for them back, we'll ask to do a full strip down on them, NDT them, non-destructive test, service them, make sure they're all good to go, and they'll do another 2,500K. That tends to equate to about three race weekends. The fluid comes into the caliper, which has a series of drillings throughout, so the fluid can flow through to behind the pistons. Oil shifts from the movement of the pedal down from the hard line, and it then moves these pistons outwards. Simple okay. as that. As, as the pistons move outwards, they're no different to your vice. Yeah. Those pistons will then clamp the disc with quite some force. And interestingly, the calipers also help with heating the tires. As you can see in this image on the right, the caliper has these additional vents that allow a prescribed amount of hot air from the discs to be blown on the wheel, which the team can change from circuit to circuit. So the brake discs. In Formula One, they're made from carbon-carbon composite, a combination of two types of carbon that creates an incredibly strong and heat-resistant material. And as you can imagine, they don't come cheap. There's no regulation, but obviously we work in a cost-capped environment now. So 
discs are rather expensive pieces, £10,000 per pair. So £20,000 a car just on discs. So if you're changing new every time you go out, you're soon going to chew through that cost cap. But you don't want to equally have the trade-off of carrying too much weight yes. and saving a little bit of money. These discs, like the rest of the braking system, are beautifully engineered to handle the incredible loads. But how exactly are the brakes attached to the wheel hub? So we use the notches as an interface to connect the, the disc itself to the axle. Um, we have a we have a hub or a disc brake bell as we call it, but you have to mount that onto something in order for it to stop the car. So the disc is splined onto the brake bell, which in turn is splined onto the hub. And then the wheel is attached to that hub. But why splines rather than bolts? Well, simply splines are much, much stronger and so can deal with the loads involved in braking. And there's another reason for the splines. They allow the disc to float. Even when you tighten them up, it's designed that if you were to hold the disc stationary and to get the bell, there would be a little bit of a rattle. But the idea of it is, as this gets super hot and you've got things like expansion, you've got vibration, you've got hitting curbs and everything starts to do that. If you, if you watch the races at the weekend, you see the slow motion of the cars and the tyres doing that. That float helps to reduce brake vibration. Yeah and give a better pedal feel. Now you may have noticed the discs have a lot of holes drilled in them and the number of holes depends on the manufacturer and the teams. Some have more holes, some have fewer and they have changed over the years. So we've got about 1,300 holes per disc and this is on a 13 inch wheel, this is an old 13 inch wheel disc. Right. When you go to 2022 brakes onwards and the wheels go to 18 inch, you have even more, about 1,500 wow. per disc. And the reason for the holes? Well, to release some of that 1,000 degrees Celsius heat. So the, the idea of the hole is to increase the surface area. So if you had the idea of loads of tiny holes is that you're increasing the surface area, same as same as those cooling fins you see on an old-fashioned air-cooled engine, yeah. you're trying to get that surface area big to try and get the heat out of it. The disc we're showing here is from 2021, when F1 wheels and therefore the discs were much smaller. However, Alpine now uses a larger brake disc with the larger wheels. Really simple principle behind it, the bigger the disc, the more leverage you have to slow the car down. Okay. So even if you've got a big wheel, you'd still not run a small disc, you try and maximise it because you get the best brakes for that size of wheel. And these discs are actually changed quite often because as always in F1, Alpine are trying to save weight. And it tends to be new for the start of qualifying that sees us through qualifying in the race. There shouldn't be any material left on it to use after the race because then yeah you're carrying too much weight. So we've covered the basics of the mechanical side of the braking system, but with energy recovery now a key part of Formula One, the rear braking had to adapt. And so it's now constantly adjusted throughout the lap and the race. When the car regenerates energy, it adds deceleration to the rear wheels, meaning less braking force is needed. If the brake pressure didn't adjust, the rear brakes would either underperform or worse, lock up and send the driver spinning into the barriers. And that's where brake by wire comes in. Operates in very much the same way as a brake master cylinder, but rather than it being controlled by the driver's foot, it's controlled by the ECU. So it's still got one hose coming in, one hose coming out, but it's equally got electricals going into it that talk to the ECU and it can it, it can then detect if we're harvesting through the MGUK, MGUH. And once the brake by wire system knows how much harvesting is taking place, it adapts to send the right amount of pressure to the rear wheels. It's then got electronic control where it can choose, am I going to send hydraulic pressure to the caliper or am I not going to send hydraulic pressure and I'm going to let the energy recovery system of the car, slow it down through engine braking. The brake by wire system is crucial for a driver for one reason, balance. If it doesn't perfectly manage the braking force, the driver loses confidence. And in Formula One, confidence is everything. A small imbalance means lost time in the braking zones, which can quickly add up over the course of a lap. And it's important to know that the brake by wire system doesn't add pressure to the rear brakes. There's no actuator. It simply restricts or allows the existing pressure to flow past it. All the brake pressure is still generated by the driver's foot on the pedal. Right. The brake by wire acts as a, as a restrictor. The brake by wire system also allows drivers to fine tune the braking balance or bias to get the most out of the tires. It helps them maximize braking by using every bit of available grip throughout the braking zone, keeping the car stable and ensuring the brakes are working at their absolute limit. So we actually tune the brake by wire to say, 
uh, when you would normally, in this given situation, give 80% effort to rear, can you just knock that down to, or, or knock it up to 82, for example? So it's, it's tuned through brake by wire. F1 brakes are incredible, but there's so much more behind the scenes at Alpine. I've also filmed a deep dive into their suspension, a 2022 gearbox, and even how they make an F1 wing. So make sure to subscribe to catch those videos when they drop. A huge thank you to Alex, Freddie and the entire team at Alpine for their amazing access. And of course, thanks to you for watching. See you next time.